Okay, I've got 8.30, so let's go ahead and get started. Good morning. How are we doing? That point in the semester, everything sort of starts to get a little tougher, you know, pile up. Uh, I feel it too. Um, I know how things work, you know, I know there was just a quiz for this class and a test for this class, and uh, now other things have to take top priority, but, you know, do your best. Make sure you're staying on top of material, um, staying on top of lectures, uh, staying on top of the practice problems. Um, it's easy to slip and fall behind. If you are worried that's happening to you, you want to reach out, make an appointment, talk about stuff, always happy to do that. Um, it's a tough class. I know it's a tough class. We don't make it a tough class because we hate you. We don't make it a tough class because uh, we're sadistic and we just like it being hard. Uh, it's a tough class because there's a lot of material, a lot of new ideas that uh, are on the syllabus and we're trying to get through them all. But I mean, we want you to succeed. We don't get anything out of this if nobody learns anything. So uh, hopefully you're still feeling good, still on top of things. Um, if you are, then uh, I mean, pat yourself on the back because plenty of us are starting to look towards the end of the semester and be like, if I can just make it there. Uh, but if uh, you are in that latter group, uh, know that it's okay. You can do it, and uh, we're here to help. Okay, I think that is enough vamping. Uh, what do we think about these graphs? Which ones are isomorphic, which ones are not? And maybe why? All right, so it's looking like we're feeling like A and C are isomorphic. So let's start with an easier question. Why is B not isomorphic to A or C? B only has one vertex with degree two. Uh, got the right idea, but I don't agree that it only has one vertex with degree two. Uh, I don't think it has any vertices of degree two, but I guess only one vertex with degree at least two would be true. But yeah, so both or all three of these graphs have four vertices and three edges. But if we look a little bit closer, B has a vertex of degree three, which is a unique property. So this one, this degree is three. And we don't see degree three vertices in A or C. So that's enough to disqualify it from being isomorphic. Even though same number of vertices, same number of edges. Then if we look at A and C, let's blow them up a little bit. It's uh, a little bit easier on a graph this small, but Um, we want to check, okay, how many vertices? Four. How many edges? Three. Um, let's look at the degree sequence. Well, we've got two vertices of degree one, two vertices of degree two. I've got the same thing over here. Two vertices of degree one, two vertices of degree two. So at some point, you can stop looking for things that might make them not isomorphic and try and figure out if they are isomorphic. And so if they're isomorphic, I need a way of uh, assigning these vertices to these vertices. Um, and so one way of doing that might be to send vertex A to vertex C, and vertex B to vertex A, and vertex C to vertex D, and vertex D to vertex B. So this is A goes to C. B goes to A, and this is not the only one, but this is one that works. C goes to D, D goes to B. And if I think about twisting this graph in that way, this, this one comes up here, and it drags A and C with it, and uh, C uh, became D, so that's fine, that's over here now, and I've got that edge that matches that edge. And it also drags A with it, A becomes C, and it's shifting down into the C position, so that's good. 
and then A moves B over, and B became A, so that's all good. Okay. So we have confirmed that those two graphs are isomorphic. And that's the general strategy for this. Um, showing that two graphs are isomorphic is a difficult problem. And so we typically try to start by finding a, a good argument, a nice easy argument that they're not isomorphic. And if we try a bunch of those, same number of vertices, same number of edges, same types of degrees, um, maybe one has a cycle and one doesn't. If all of those are failing, then we start to say, okay, well maybe, maybe they are isomorphic. And then we start looking for this, this assignment. Okay, uh, so I wanna to shift to something else. I also want to keep this page up, so I'm gonna cut off this little area. So the complement of a graph is a graph where I turn all of the edges into non-edges and all of the non-edges into edges. Uh, so G bar, just like we had a set complement, we put a line up top. For a graph complement, we also put a line up top. Is the graph with vertex set V of G. So G has some vertices. G bar has the same exact vertices. And X, Y is an element of G bar if and only if. To remember, we write with this extra F. This means if and only if. That is not an edge in G. Okay, so more, carve out some more space. So here's an example. I have some graph on five vertices. Let's do that. I wanna make the complement graph. This would be G. Oops. Just G. Then I want to draw a G bar. Okay. So let's start with the vertex. Let's start with this one. So this vertex is adjacent here, so I, I put no edge here. It's adjacent here, so I put no edge there. There's no edge from this vertex to this vertex, so there is one in G bar. And then no edge here. Let's move to another vertex, this one. So they're adjacent, so they're not in the complement. They're adjacent, so they're not in the complement. These are not adjacent, so I get another edge here. And then they were adjacent to the original graph, so they're not here. Okay, keep going. That's an edge in the original graph, so it's not here. That's an edge in the original graph, so it's not here. There's no edge from here to here, so there is in the complement. No edge from here to here, so there is in the complement. Come down to this one. In the original graph, there's only one edge from here to here, so in the complement should be adjacent to three things. Turns out it already is. And then here, adjacent to these two, so it should be adjacent to the other two, and it, uh, oh, sorry, to these three. So it should just be adjacent to that other one. So I've, this is G, I've now drawn G complement. So first question, 
what is G complement complement. Yeah, good. If I take this graph and I swap all the edges, and then I take this graph and I swap all the edges, each edge has been swapped twice. So here it's an edge, here it's not, here it is again. And they have the same vertex set the whole time. So just like we had double negation for sets, we also have them for graphs. Okay. Next question, is it possible that g bar equals g. Can I take a graph, take its complement, and end up with the same graph? Ah, very nice. Jonathan Lee's got my, my tricky answer. This is a yes. in quotation marks because of the single vertex. If I just have one vertex and I take its complement, I'm back at the one vertex. But let's assume I have more than one vertex. So I'm just going to copy down this question so it's clear what's going on. Is it possible that g bar equals g? Well, yes, if I have one vertex, if g is equal to the graph, one vertex, an empty set. But what if I have at least two vertices? Okay, now I have a graph with at least two vertices. So I have a vertex A and I have a vertex B. And my question is, is the edge a b an edge, or is the pair a b an edge and i have to have different answers in g and g bar in one of them it'll be an edge in another one it won't be So is it possible for two graphs to be equal if I have at least two vertices? Right, no. So no, they can't be equal. But it's not really equal that we care about, right? Because Graphs being equal is a really tough condition. What are we really interested in when we ask if two graphs are the same? Equal is not really the right question. What we really want to ask is, are they isomorphic? So better question. Is it possible that I have at least two vertices, so I can get rid of this silly, just a single vertex example. And I don't want G equal to G bar anymore. I just want it isomorphic to G bar. This is a tougher question. Because sure, I have two vertices, 
one time they're an edge and one time they're not an edge. But maybe that's just because I need to do some relabeling. But it's clear if I only have two vertices, then it's not true, right? I've got two isolated vertices. If I take the complement, I get one edge. There's a different number of edges there. So they're not isomorphic. Uh, loops, so remember, when we're talking about graphs, we mean graphs without loops in general. Uh, taking complements when you consider loops gets messy because uh, then you have to ask does every vertex without a loop get a loop so I don't want to talk about uh, complements with loops we're gonna assume they're loops so okay let's look into what this would take What are the first few things we check if we want to ask, are two graphs isomorphic? What are things we look for? Same number of vertices, same number of edges. And then degrees is another good one. So same number of vertices that one we actually get for free because they're on the same vertex set right if you take a complement you're always going to get the same number of vertices same number of edges though that's an interesting one so this this leads us to a question how many edges in G complement? Let's see if we can figure this out. So I look at a graph. And it has n vertices. And let's say it has m edges. This is in G. How many edges does my complement have? Yeah, so good. The number of edges in my complement is the total possible number, number of edges minus the number of edges I have. What is the total possible number of edges? Well, we just finished combinatorics. Good. Num the maximum number of edges we can have is an edge between every distinct pair of vertices. So if I have n vertices, I have n choose two possible edges. So how many edges are there in G complement? n choose two minus n. And so if we want there to be the same number of edges, if we want the number of edges in G equal to the number of edges in G bar, that means that we want m equal to n choose 2 minus m, which implies 2m is equal to n choose 2 is n times n minus 1 over 2. Or m is equal to n times n minus 1 over 4. So this tells us something. If if G is isomorphic 
to G complement, then the number of edges is equal to n times n minus 1 over 4. I know how many edges I'm looking for. And this does tell me a little bit more as well. The number of edges had better be an integer, right? So that means either n is divisible by 4, or n minus 1 is it divisible by 4. Right? We've also done divisibility. This is popping up now. Why? Why is this true? Well, it can't be the case that 2 divides n and 2 divides n minus 1 because the GCD of n and n minus 1 is equal to 1. That's something we could prove. Right? This is very similar to a type of question you've seen before. So this problem is combining a lot of different ideas that we've seen. We've got a counting problem here. What's the total number of edges? We've got a divisibility problem here. This is why we're teaching you all of these different ideas. They all come together when we're doing discrete math. Okay, so if I'm looking for a graph that's isomorphic to its complement, I shouldn't look on two vertices. All right, we already know that that one's not going to work, but Here's another reason why it won't work. I shouldn't look at three vertices. I should be looking at four or five vertex graphs, or maybe eight or nine. So this gives us a good place to look. So let's look at um, such a G on N equals four vertices. I know how many edges I should have. M should be equal to 4 times 3 divided by 4 is 3 edges. So what I can do is look at some graphs on three vertices on four vertices and three edges and look at their complements. So I need three edges. I could do this. I could do this. I could do this. Just some examples. Let's see what happens when I take complements. So this one had a vertex of degree 3. It now has degree 0. This one is adjacent to these two. This one is adjacent to those two. And I get that picture. So without even doing too much work, what's the complement of this graph going to look like? Well, these two are isomorphic, right? So if this complement gave me this, then this complement is going to give me basically this, although I have to be careful. So my, my vertex of degree 3, my vertex of degree 0, becomes my vertex of degree 3. But I know I'm going to get a picture like this. Good. So this one is not self-complementary. These are not isomorphic because vertex of degree 3, vertex of degree 0. This one's not for the same reason. But if I take the complement of this graph, I get edge here, edge here, and edge here. And are those two graphs complementary? 
Are, are those two graphs isomorphic? Yeah, right? This was our, this was our warm-up question. Look at that. Yeah, same picture. It's like I planned this whole lecture. Yes, these two are isomorphic. So, can a graph be isomorphic to its own complement? Yes. And we call these graphs self-complementary because they are complements to themselves. And here's the moral of the story. If a graph can be self-complementary, so can you. Give yourself a compliment. You deserve it. You work hard. Graphs can have that self-confidence. You can also have that self-confidence. There's your terrible graph theory joke for this morning. Uh, I don't want to say that the first 25 minutes of this class were setting up that joke, but I will say I planned the whole lecture and this joke was in the plan. So on some level, we did some good mathematics so that I could make that terrible joke. Okay. Let's, uh, let's move on from that. Here's a theorem. If the minimum degree of a graph, remember this is the Greek letter delta, lowercase delta means minimum degree, is greater than or equal to 2, then G contains a subgraph that is a cycle. So I want to just want to sit on this one for a second. So I'm claiming this is a theorem. I'm going to prove it. But I want you to think about why this might be true first and see if together we can come up with a strategy for proving this. So here's our thinking box. So I start with some vertex, and it has degree at least two. Now all I'm looking for is a cycle. So if these two are adjacent, then I'm done. I've got my cycle, it's got three vertices in it. So if they're not adjacent, well, each one has degree at least two, so there must be some other vertex I can go to. And now I do that process again. If these two are adjacent, or if in fact this one's adjacent to anything I've already seen so far, then I have a cycle, right? If I, if I just add in this edge, then I can ignore this other vertex and I can just look at that cycle there. So if they're not adjacent to anything I've seen so far, then they have minimal degree at least two, there must be two more vertices I can find. Can I get stuck? Is there any way I can keep doing this and then I just run out of new vertices to add?
there any way to get like locked in a corner. Yeah, right. It doesn't seem like there should be any way to get stuck. It doesn't seem like I should. I'll put a question mark here because we're not entirely sure, but it seems like I should be able to just keep going. And then second question, can I go forever? If it's not possible for me to get stuck, if I can't be like, okay, well, uh, I've done this process for a while and now there's no way to keep going. I'm saying, I don't think that can happen. The other thing that might go wrong is I just keep going forever. I just keep adding vertex after vertex after vertex forever and ever and ever. Is that a concern? I mean, maybe, right? Seems like I can keep going forever. But if I know how many vertices I have, then eventually I'll hit a limit. So I'm gonna put a, a kinda here. I can just keep adding vertices and adding vertices and adding vertices. But if I know how many vertices G has, then eventually I'm going to run out. If G has a fixed number of vertices, eventually I will run out. So this was our thinking box. This was going into what we're going to use to prove this theorem. And again, I, you know, I say this almost every class, but it's true. Now I'm going to write down the proof for the theorem. And two things should be true. The proof should make the theorem sound obvious. And the proof should make me look like a genius. It should be like, oh, yeah, that's definitely the right way of explaining that. That makes it so easy to understand. Writing proofs is easy, except then you go to try and write a proof and it's hard and you know, what's up with that? So this thinking box does not show up in my proof directly, but it's what I'm thinking about. It's what justifies this proof. So here's the situation. I'm thinking that if I didn't find a cycle, I would be able to just keep adding vertices and adding vertices and adding vertices. But if I have a fixed number of vertices, I would run out and there's no way for me to get stuck. I'm gonna prove this by contradiction. So proof. Assume for the sake of contradiction, assume for sake of contradiction that delta of G is greater than or equal to two and G contains no cycles. Okay. And there's a key idea that came out of my thinking box. I need to fix how many vertices I have. G is some graph. And remember, we're assuming our graphs are not infinite graphs. We're assuming there's a finite number of vertices. So we'll assume that the number of vertices in G is equal to N. Okay. So I'm gonna start with some vertex V1. And since my minimal degree is at least two, there are two more vertices, V2 and V3, such that V1, V2, and V1, V3, are in my graph. Okay. 
then I can just focus on v3. Again, since the minimal degree of g is at least 2, there exists another vertex, u, such that v3 comma u is an edge in my graph. And here's the important idea. If u is a vertex I've already seen before, that would give me a cycle. If u is equal to vi for some i that's less than 3, that creates a cycle. Then starting at vi, vi plus 1, all the way up to v3, and then back to vi is a cycle. Which we assume does not exist. Therefore, I can turn this vi into, I can turn this u into v4. It's a new vertex. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use induction to repeat that process. Repeating this process I can find V5, V6, all the way up to V sub n such that V sub i and v sub i plus 1 is always an edge. And I don't have any edges back. So, and uh, v, sub, uh, uh, v sub j, v sub i is not an edge. If j is less than i minus 1. So I know you're always adjacent to the thing that comes one before you, but if you jump back two or more, then you're not adjacent, because that would create a cycle. Okay, so I have this process. I'll even draw in a picture, just so we're, we're clear what's going on. I found V1, which has V2 and V3. And then I found a v4, and I found a v5, and I went all the way up to vn. Oops, I'm off the bottom of the page. Now I'm ready to get my contradiction. Since delta of g is at least 2, Vn is adjacent to some vertex other than Vn minus 1. I've run out of vertices though. Since I've already listed all the vertices in the graph, this other vertex that's adjacent to must have come earlier. Since G only has n vertices, this other vertex must be V sub J for some J smaller than n minus 1. It's not the one that comes right before. Let me add to my picture.
Got to be something back here. And that means that if I start at V sub J and then I go to V sub J plus one and V sub J plus two, and I keep going all the way up to V sub N and then back to V sub J, that's gonna be a cycle. And that's a contradiction that I can't see. This contradicts G not having a cycle. Okay. So this proof looks pretty involved, right? It's kind of long, takes up two pages, but it doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of this idea. Why would it have a cycle? Well, let me try to draw one without a cycle. Oh, I just get a really long path. But eventually I run out of vertices. And so this path has to fold back in on itself somewhere. And that's where I get my cycle. Okay, let's pause there for a second. Give everybody a chance to get caught up. Go grab some water. Run to the restroom if you need. We'll come back in two minutes. Uh, so we will start again. Uh, part of the way through 914. I got 9, 12, and 30 seconds. So we'll come back 914 and 30 seconds. Dense notes so far. It's only my sixth piece of paper. Frequently these lectures go like nine to 11 pieces of paper, only through six, squeezed a lot in. Okay, let's gather back together, refocus, push through the rest of the lecture. So way back when, I talked about how if there was an edge from x to y, we said that x and y were adjacent. And I said there was a word that we were not allowed to use. I said, we can't say that they're connected by an edge because connected has a special meaning. So let's talk about that special meaning. So we say X and Y are connected if there is a path from x to y. So thinking about graph, 
favorite example graph that I keep coming back to. If I pick two vertices here, X and Y, I can find a couple of paths to X and Y, but I only need one. So there's an example of a path from X to Y. So X and Y are not adjacent. There's no edge directly from X to Y, but they are connected. They're connected because I can get from X to Y by traveling along edges. And then we say a graph is connected if every pair of vertices is connected. So if I can pick any two vertices in the graph and get from one to the other by traveling along edges, then I say my graph is connected. So this graph is not connected because it has this isolated vertex. There's no way to get from here to anywhere else. If you remember back, this was the uh, graph of two letter postal codes for the Canadian provinces um, overlapping. And this one was Prince Edward Island. No other province has P or E in its postal code and uh, postal abbreviation. I like that because also Prince Edward Island is an island, so there's no way to get to it. I don't know. These are the things that entertain me. Uh, so yes, it's isolated, so this graph is not connected. And so we've seen other examples. Uh, so we saw these graphs earlier. This graph is connected, but its complement is not connected. So this is connected. This is not connected or disconnected. And one more definition, a maximally connected subgraph is called a component. So this graph has one component. This graph has two components. If I just took these two vertices, that's not a component because I can add in this other vertex and it's still connected to everything. So sometimes these components are called connected components, which is a little bit redundant, but it really emphasizes that each component itself is a connected graph. And then if we stick multiple connected graphs together, we can get a bigger graph uh, that just isn't connected. All right, moving on from that. So we've talked about Eulerian graphs. So just as a reminder, an Eulerian graph is a graph with an Eulerian um, trail, uh, an Eulerian circuit rather. So a graph where you can take every edge. We briefly mentioned this, but now I wanna go into some detail. A Hamiltonian graph is where you can hit every vertex. So, Hamiltonian cycle is a, uh, a cycle containing every vertex. A 
Hamiltonian path. is a path containing every vertex. And a Hamiltonian graph is a graph with a Hamiltonian cycle. try and come up with some Hamiltonian graphs. The question is a complete graph Hamiltonian. Can I find a cycle that goes through all of the vertices of a complete graph? Yes, 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 question mark. Good. This is a little bit of a trick question. The answer is almost yes. So I'll, I'll say yes, and then I'll put an almost out in front. So what is our big idea? The point is that I have every edge possible. Which is a lot. A lot of edges. I think I have them all. And so I can normally just start at V1 and then go to V2 and V3 and V4 and V5 and V6 and all the way around. And I, that, that'll be fine. I have every edge possible, so that'll always give me a cycle. Unless what? Why is that an almost? What's the one complete graph where this won't work? Remember, it has to be a cycle, so I have to end up back where I started. Yeah, there's one just unfortunate counterexample, which is if n is 2, then it doesn't work. Even if n is 1, if n is 1, then that's your cycle. You start and end at the same vertex. Is that a cycle? I don't know. Seems like it should count. But if n is 2, there's definitely no cycle. So as long as n is not equal to 2, then for any ordering of the vertices, v1, v2, v3, all the way up to Vn, back to V1, is a Hamiltonian cycle. Okay. Let's try another one. A little bit harder. When is... K, N, M, Hamiltonian. So quick review, when is, so K, N, M is the complete bipartite graph. So I've got N vertices over here, M vertices over here, and all of the edges in between. So really quick review, when is K, N, M Eulerian? When can I use up every edge? 
yeah, I need everything to have an even degree, which in the case of the complete bipartite graph means n and m are both even. So quick review. K and m is Eulerian if and only if and n and m are both even. Because if n is even, then everything over here has even degree. And if m is even, everything over here has even degree. And we're Eulerian if and only if every vertex has even degree. So in order to be Eulerian, we need them to both be even. Now, when is K and M Hamiltonian? When can I find a path that goes through every vertex? Previous page up for I'll give it another second. So what, what's gonna make this Hamiltonian? How can I hit every vertex? So what, what does my, my Hamiltonian cycle look like? If I start on this side, where am I gonna go? Always gotta go to the other side. And then once I'm on this side, I gotta go back. So my Hamiltonian cycle has got to bounce back and forth between these two. If I want to hit every vertex, and remember, it's got to be a cycle. I can't reuse vertices. Then I need n to be equal to m. If I don't have n equal to m, then I'll use up one of the sides first. If n is not equal to m, I use up one side first. All right, I'll have some vertices over here, and those will all be matched with some vertices over here, you know, with something else going on, but then I'll have too many vertices on one side and I'll be stuck because I won't be able to stay on this side anymore. All right, I can, I can do this, but then I can't, I can't loop back around. I can't stay on this side. I'm just out of luck. But if N is equal to M, then I can pair up all of my vertices. I have the same number, so I can pair them all up. And then I can just do these cross edges which is really just pairing them up a second time and then loop back around to finish. And what's the one example where this doesn't work again? This is a Hamiltonian cycle, unless what? Unless I have two vertices. If they're equal, but they're both one, then I just have an edge again, and I didn't actually do this. So if n equals m greater than 1, then this works. So when is this Hamiltonian? If n is equal to m and bigger than 1, then I can get Hamiltonian. 
there is more stuff I want to talk about today, so I do want to do one more example, but I'm going to run through it a little bit quickly. A little complicated. The, I'll leave this up for another second. The hypercube is Hamiltonian. Once I have uh, k at least two. QK is Hamiltonian for K greater than or equal to two. So remember these, um, these cubes, I start with a square and then I get a three dimensional cube And these come from the strings of ones and zeros. Sorry about that. These come from the, the strings of ones and zeros. So this is zero, zero, which is connected to one, zero, and zero, one. And that's connected to one, one. And these are strings of length three. And then I take two of these cubes on dimension three and connect them. Let's see if I can do this. And one way to think about this is I'm adding. So these are all the strings where the first digit is a zero. And these are all the strings where the first digit is a one. They look the same. And then I can always get from one vertex to the corresponding vertex. And this is how you build up your hypercubes. They get real messy looking, but they have this recursive structure in them. And so the way that you find a Hamiltonian path is by induction. So on this example, I find my Hamiltonian path by taking this edge, which is changing the last digit, and then I change the first digit, and then I undo the path I just did. And then I can finish my cycle. And the idea for finding this Hamiltonian path is I just repeat that process every time I go up a layer. on lots of cubes today and I'm not especially good at it. Went to math school, not to art school. Okay, so I repeat the same process except instead of completing the cycle, I'm gonna drop down and I'm gonna do the same path I did in reverse and then I'll complete the cycle. And that even works here. Start here. Follow my old cycle, except instead of completing, I drop down and I do the same cycle in reverse. And then I complete my cycle. And that's how I'm getting a Hamiltonian path on these hypercubes. So I did run through that quickly. There is a nice induction proof. Um, I think it's even in your textbook, uh, but I don't have time to run through it all now because um, I do want to talk about a new topic in the last 10 minutes, but I do think it's really cool, this, this recursive structure and is a good fact to know. Um, if k equals 1, then you just have an edge, and we know that the edge is not Hamiltonian. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about today is vertex coloring. So 
So here's the idea behind vertex coloring. I have some graph. Any graph will do. And I want to put a color on each vertex. But I don't want two vertices next to each other to share the same color. So this vertex is blue, which means I want this vertex to be red. I don't want them to share a color. And this vertex is next to a blue vertex and a red vertex, so I'm going to color it green. And now this vertex uh, I can also make green. And now this vertex is already next to a red vertex and a green vertex, so I'm going to make it blue. And this vertex is already next to a blue vertex and a green vertex, so I'm going to make it red. And then this vertex is next to a red and a green, so I'm going to make it blue. So a proper a proper k vertex coloring of a graph G is an assignment of colors to every vertex so that no edge is incident to two vertices of the same color. So this is a proper three vertex coloring. Three is not the number of vertices, it's the number of colors. Sometimes we just say a proper three coloring if it's clear we're talking about vertices. So here's my question. Can I color or could I color this graph with four colors. So I used blue, red, and green, but could I have done it with four colors? Is it possible? Yeah, right? I can just change any one of the colors. Right? Make, make this one purple instead. And now I have a four vertex coloring. Just use an extra color. That's not a problem. So, sure. Why not? Could I color this vertex proper color this vertex using two colors. No. Right? There's a problem. If I just focus on this triangle bit, if this vertex is blue, and this vertex is green, there's no color left. This can't be blue, can't be green. I need a third color. Oops. Yet another shirt with a marker stain on it, such as the life of a teacher. No, two colors is not enough. So somehow, three 
is the minimal number of colors for this graph. It's something about this graph. that demands three colors. And so that is the chromatic number of the graph. Chromatic number, which we use the Greek letter chi of G, is the smallest number of colors required. to properly vertex color. And the chromatic number of a graph is another one of these things that's true for any isomorphic graph. So if you can show that one graph requires more colors to color than another graph, then you know that they're not isomorphic. This is another thing we can put on our list of things to check. Although chromatic number is not always an easy thing to check. But let's, uh, let's look at some examples. So what is the chromatic number of the path graph? on n vertices. If I draw a nice little path, how many colors do I need? Yeah, good. and I can just alternate. Blue, green, blue, green, blue, green, and I'll be fine. So my chromatic number here is equal to two. Weird counterexample unless n is equal to one. If I have the path graph with just one vertex, all right, you got me, that's a silly example. Then I only need one color. But as long as I have two vertices, then I need two colors. Slightly harder. What is chromatic number of the complete graph on n vertices? I have every edge possible. Yeah. If I have every edge possible, everything is adjacent to everything else, so I can never reuse a color. If I ever use the same color twice, that means that it's adjacent, they're adjacent to each other. going to be equal to n. All right, one last example. What is the chromatic number of the cycle with n vertices? This is a tricky one. Ah, there we go. We're getting to the core. It depends on if n is even or odd. If n is even, then I just have this long path where I swap green, blue, green, blue, green, blue, and then I can just connect at the end. 
But if n is odd, then I have green, blue, green, blue, green, blue, green. I'm sorry, if, uh, yeah, if, uh, yeah, green, blue, green, blue, green, blue, green, and they connect back to each other and that's a problem. So I can't reuse green, but I can't use blue again. That's when I need a third color. So this is two if n is even and three if n is odd. Cycles are tricky. Flops back and forth. Okay, uh, so we will continue next class. We'll talk more about chromatic number uh, and then we'll get into some planarity stuff and we'll talk about trees next time. Lots of good stuff. Uh, so I'll see everybody then. Um, keep talking on discussion board. Keep reaching out to me with questions by email. Just want to reiterate one more time. If you're feeling behind, you're not alone. You can do this. We can help. Take care, everybody.